Now, to begin the, the conference, I feel that the Lord would have me speak on the subject that's down, which is the seal of God. And I want to tell you how the Lord told me to speak on this particular subject. A few years ago, I'd had one of those weeks. Do you ever get one of those weeks? Everything seemed so heavy. Everyone seemed so troublesome. It seemed as if the devil was really gaining victory after victory as time went on. And I was praying and I was seeking the Lord. And somehow the Lord seemed an awful long way away. And the heavens just seemed as brass. And the week went on. And this week went on as well. You know, I felt very weak at the t uh, as the week went on. And I just was seeking the Lord and asking the Lord, what should I do? And the longer the week seemed to be, the more I seemed to be um, approaching the time when I would start hitting the panic button, you know, and start really sending all the alarm bells ringing and what's going on and this is going wrong and that's going wrong and Lord, what is it? And I was praying one morning, I think it was Friday, you know, the Lord always lets you have a week like that to see how you react. And on Friday morning, I got before the Lord and he gave me a really lovely vision. And at first I thought it was a, an, an odd vision. And I, I began to think about this and, oh Lord, what's this? But gradually as the thing unfolded, I began to see the wonderful, glorious message that the Lord had for me. And the vision was this. I saw a beautiful field, completely green field, very lush indeed. And in one corner of this field, there was the smallest lamb I'd seen for a long time. And the lamb was completely peaceful, completely happy. It didn't have a care in the world and it was munching the grass. Oh, it was idyllic. And over in the opposite corner, I saw something else. I saw a black snake, very black right? A big snake. And as I watched with the lamb munching away in the corner and the snake in the other corner, I began to see the snake sidle up to the lamb right across the field. And I thought, Lord, what's, what's going on? What is this about? And I hoped that the lamb would move out of the way, but nothing happened. The lamb was there and it was just munching the grass and didn't seem to be worried. And at first I thought it hadn't seen the snake. And then I realized that it had seen the snake but it just kept on munching. And as I watched, I saw this black snake began to curl itself around the legs of the lamb. Now the lamb made no attempt to get away. It just remained there. And, and it carried on munching the grass. It didn't seem a bit concerned. It was me that was getting concerned about this. And I saw the snake come and it en enveloped the lamb, wrapped itself around the body of the lamb. And finally the lamb just toppled over because of the weight of the snake. And then the snake opened its mouth and I saw it about to put the lamb's head into its mouth. And then something remarkable happened. Suddenly, the eyes of the snake seemed to bulge out of its head and the snake dropped completely dead. And as I watched, the body of the snake began unfurling itself from the little body of the lamb. And the lamb just got up and carried on munching the grass and started jumping about. And I said, Lord, what is this? What is it? And the Lord just said this. He said, that was no ordinary lamb. That was the Passover lamb. That lamb had been separated unto me, and that lamb was going to be mine. And if something's mine, then the enemy cannot have it. Now, wasn't that lovely? And I began to see, well, isn't this wonderful? There's no point in hitting the panic button and rushing all around, you know, the, the field and, and so on, getting really anxious about this. All I had to do was to stand firm in who I was. And even though the devil seemed to encroach, I knew that the devil would have to flee. It does say, doesn't it? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And it actually says there, keep on resisting the devil. It's not an immediate thing, but keep on resisting the devil. And you will find in a certain moment of time, the devil will flee from you. And that's what the vision had been about. And that vision came back just a few weeks ago to me, and very strongly indeed. And I felt it quickened to share it with you. And the Lord just said this, the lamb knew who he was. The lamb knew that he was separated unto his God and he knew that God had marked him in a special way and that he was going to fulfill the purposes of God. And because of that, no matter what the devil tried to do, no matter what the snake tried to do, the snake was powerless 
because God had marked him. And suddenly, a few weeks ago, I realized this, that the majority of Christians, you know, lack the knowledge that that lamb had. That lamb knew what it was, and so disarmed the devil. We as Christians have got to know who we are and what God has done for us and in us if we are going to see the devil disarmed. Isn't it interesting that in the, in the early church they really knew who they were? I mean, they knew they were glorious. They were living in the reality of the resurrection of Christ. They spoke about the resurrection of Christ. They were talking about the risen Jesus all the time. And that's why in the book of Acts, you count it up for yourself. The devil's hardly mentioned. Did you know that? In the book of Acts, the devil, I think, is mentioned four times only. And every time the devil is mentioned, it's always to do with his defeat. You know, talking about the wonderful victory we've got over the devil. And so he's mentioned there. But really, the whole passage uh, is about victory. Every passage where the devil is mentioned ends victoriously. They knew who they were and they knew what God had done to them. And because of that, they found that the devil, try though he might, just was disarmed before them. Now, today, you hear an awful lot about victorious Christian living and an awful lot about faith and so on. And yet I've noticed this, that many, many Christians who are talking about faith and talking about uh, the move of the Spirit and so on, they talk an awful lot about the devil as well. And many of them err, I think, because very often when they are talking, they are giving glory to the devil that he should never have. Have you ever known Christians like this? Have, have you ever met this sort of Christian? I'm sure you never have. But I meet them all the time. They know what the devil's done all right. Yes, they know he's powerful. Many of them are afraid of him. They know the devil has bankrupted them, and they know the devil has done this in their childhood, and they know the devil's done that. The problem is that they don't know enough of the positive side. You see, reciting what the devil's done, and yet they're unable to recite what God has done. Do you know that lovely little verse found in Romans 16 that just says this, that we are to be wise concerning that which is good? Do you remember that little verse? And then it says, and we're to be simple concerning evil. And then it says, and my God will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Do you all know that verse? Wise about that which is good, simpletons concerning that which is evil, and then shortly, not immediately perhaps, you'll see the devil crushed under your feet. But what do you find? The majority of Christians are not wise concerning that which is good. They're very wise concerning that which is evil. Right? Anyone who has done ministry will know this is the case. I actually was rather naughty. I tried it out on one or two people. And occasionally you get the person who comes for ministry, you know, and they start off and they begin reciting their woes. They know what they can't do and they know that they failed here and so on. In fact, I, I was mentioning to one person and after three hours, they'd only reached the age of 12. They've been reciting, you know, all the woes that had happened to them after three hours. The age of 12 was reached, and I think they were 59 or something like this. I thought I was going to be there for a month ministering to these folks. And I finally stopped this person, and I just said, okay, now you're telling me all the negative. Will you now tell me a bit of the positive? What has God done as far as you are concerned? And the woman stopped for a moment. I mean, she'd been talking nonstop for several hours. She suddenly stopped. And she said, well, um, of course, I'm saved. I know that I'm saved, and I know I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And at that point, she began to run out. She couldn't think of much else. And there was ignorance concerning that which God had done in her life. Now, you'll notice that verse actually could be rewritten. We could say, be wise concerning that which is evil. Be simple concerning that which is good, and Satan will crush you under his feet shortly. We could actually reverse the thing. And many, many Christians know that as their experience. We've got to go back to the time that was, well, really, to the experience that was true of us when we were converted, when all we knew was Christ and his resurrection and his resurrected power. I didn't stop talking about the wonderful things that God had done for me. Wow, my whole life was nothing but a long testimony. That's why I probably joined the FGBMFI, I don't know. But my whole life was just a constant testimony, on and on and on and on, testifying of the good things that God had done. God's done this, God's done that, God's done the other. And you know, in those days, the devil didn't get a look in. Isn't it funny how somehow he seems to sidle up to us all? You've got to know who you are. 
the lamb knew that God had his mark upon him. And because he knew it, he had no fear concerning the devil. Now that's the subject that I want to deal with tonight. Do you know that God has sealed you, every one of you? Do you know that if you're a believer, God has put his mark upon you and he's actually proclaimed to all the principalities and powers that these are mine, my precious ones, my blood-bought ones, the ones for whom I died. And here they are, my precious jewels, and he's put his mark on you. And that means that every one of us, knowing that, can come into a place of relaxation in the victory that is ours in Christ. Now let me take you through one or two passages that talk about this mark or this seal and I think you'll begin to see the sort of idea and then we'll go through to the New Testament to have a look at the fact that we are sealed. Now I want to begin in Genesis and chapter 4. Genesis and chapter 4 and with this unlikely character Cain. Genesis chapter 4 All right, you remember, don't you, Cain and Abel were two of the sons of Adam and Eve. By the way, Adam and Eve had many, 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 many children. These were two, two boys. And you remember that Cain was very angry with Abel because God had accepted the offering that uh, Abel had made to him. And, and Cain was so angry that he decided he'd murder his brother. When this story is talked of uh, in the New Testament, it becomes very clear that Cain actually sacrificed his brother. You can imagine the jealousy that was in Cain's heart. The only killing he'd seen had been the sacrificing of the animals. And he had seen that when an animal was sacrificed, God accepted the offering. When no animal was sacrificed, there was no acceptance of the offering. And in his fury, he said, very well, God, you want an offering, I'll give you an offering and see if you like this. And taking a sacrificial knife, he slit his brother's throat, and Abel was killed. And God just says this. Now, we begin verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? He said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Who's this everyone? These are the other children of Adam and Eve furious with the blood of, of Abel, furious about his death. And these people would come up to Cain and say, you killed him, and they would start threatening Cain. And this is what was uh, concerning Cain in this passage. Now look what God says, and this is very significant, verse, the, uh, verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. They could come up and threaten. They could come up and uh, say all manner of evil against him. But because the mark of God was on him, they couldn't touch the fellow. Now, we don't know what this mark was. You know, you often read books and, and they say, oh, well, this mark was obviously such and such. We don't actually know what it is. Some people say it's this port wine stain, you know, that some people have. I really don't believe it. We don't know whether this mark could be seen, you know, that it was clearly visible, or whether God had just communicated that he'd put a secret mark upon We know nothing. All we know is this, that if God said that his mark was on this man, and that God would protect him, there was one person who was protected, and that was dear Cain. Cain could relax because the mark of God was on him. Now in this day, they didn't dwell in cities, they just dwelt in tents, you know, in local communities. The trouble was, Cain didn't believe that God had really put his mark upon him to protect him. And you find that Cain here begins to dwell in insecurity. Have you noticed that when there's insecurity in a person, they start doing something. Everyone does it who's insecure. They start building walls around themselves. Have you ever noticed that? 
right? And sometimes the walls are pretty tough as well. If you know someone who's insecure, you have to be very careful, lest you touch a raw nerve and suddenly the wall goes up, and then it's almost impenetrable. And Cain began to do that. Cain, who had the promise of God upon him, who could have relaxed, actually, all of a sudden, no, I, I've got to protect myself. I don't trust these people. They're after me. And he did something. Let's read on. Verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. By the way, we're finishing the meeting slightly earlier today so that you can get to the land of Nod, right? Not east of Eden, that one. He dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Now look at this, verse 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And here is Cain not trusting in the mark of God, and as a result of the insecurity that he had, he had to put walls up around. And the first city was built because of a lack of trust in God's seal. Isn't that amazing? The mark of God was on him, he didn't trust it. I've got to protect myself, and up went the walls. Do you know the oldest word for city in the world is a cuneiform word, and it's the word Enuk, Enuk, or Eruk, some, uh, it became, Eruk, Enuk. It comes from this lad's name, Enoch. Here he is, got a little boy called Enoch, calls the city Enoch. Makes perfect sense. But there was insecurity there. And if we as Christians don't believe that God has truly sealed us and put his mark upon us to protect us, to look after us, to bless us, do you know we're going to do what Cain did? We'll start building our own security, thanks very much. And as a result, we'll become, like so many Christians, hard, gnarled, twisted, so afraid that we're going to be hurt again. I've been hurt so often, and I'm, I, I'm not going to allow myself to be hurt again. There it is. With the minute you hear words like that, you know there's someone who doesn't really know God's protection upon them. Let's have a look at another mark. Now, some of these will be visible, some will be invisible. But uh, I feel it's right to go through some of these. Go on to Exodus and chapter 12. Now, this is a, a lovely mark and one that we can use. Exodus and chapter 12. And we come to the time when God is challenging the gods of the Egyptians. Do you remember the plagues that were sent upon the Egyptians? Well, the Egyptians used to worship certain things, and what God was saying during these uh, plagues was that he was greater than their gods. They worshipped the River Nile. So God said, oh, you think the River Nile's so great, do you? Very well. You think uh, the Nile's so great? Moses, you tell the Nile to turn into blood. And Moses did. And the message to the Egyptians was, don't trust in that God. There's one God. He's the God of the Israelites. Well, after all the plagues, we come to the last and most devastating. And here we come to the death of the firstborn, when the angel of death would come upon the land of Egypt and the firstborn would be killed from every family. Now the Hebrews had to be protected. How was God going to protect them? Well, I'll tell you how. He was going to put a mark on them. God uses this very frequently. A mark was going to be put upon them. Not now an individual, but a whole household was going to be marked. Let's read it, verse uh, 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw you out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. Now do you see that? That's a mark being put on the house. There it is. Take the lamb, collect the blood, and don't just leave the blood in the bowl, but take some hyssop and actually daub it on your doorposts. The lovely thing is this. If you imagine the bowl of blood at their feet, they were making actually the sign of the cross in their doorway. It's rather nice, this. You know, they took the hyssop and they put some on the top lintel, and then they put some on that side, and then they put some on that side, and so you had this beautiful blood cross in the doorway. And the promise of God was this, that when the angel of death saw the blood, he'd pass over. The Jews have just celebrated the Passover. Did you know that? Just a few days ago. It was lovely. I had great joy telling my little boy about all this. We'd just reached it at, on the right evening. I thought, praise the Lord. And I told him all about the Passover and how the angel of death passed over when it saw the blood. Read it. Let's read the next verse. 
For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. For ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And there it was. Now, as long as they were in the house, they were safe. And the angel of death passed over. By the way, what were they doing in the house? Well, obviously they were having a meal. Yes, that's true. But what else were they doing? In some of the houses, you know, they were really nervous. Oh, God is going to, you know, pa the angel of death is going to pass right over us. God's going to send death in the land. I hope we're going to be all right. No, I really do. I hope we're going to be all right. And they were sitting there really fearful. Others, however, undoubtedly, were uh, having a time of rejoicing in the house. You know, a nice quiet evening, praise the Lord. They couldn't go out, wasn't allowed. And they sat there, had a marvelous time. Who knows, they must have played Monopoly. Something like, it was wonderful. You know, go to Vine Street or go to Goshen, don't pass, don't collect 200 pounds and all the rest. You know, whatever they were doing. But there could have been in those houses two different reactions. One, a reaction of fear for those who didn't really believe in the seal of God. The other, a completely relaxed mental attitude because they did believe in the seal. By the way, do you use the blood of Jesus? Do you? Some people think it's enough, you know, to have had the blood spilt. But here it wasn't. It's not enough to have the blood spilt and put it in a bowl and just forget it. You have to actually use it. That's why I believe that most uh, spirit-filled Christians actually make use of the blood of Jesus. I found the blood of Jesus to be extremely potent as a weapon. I have found that. That's why in our house, certainly, every morning, we just, my wife and I just claim the blood of Jesus right over the house, right over us. It's marvelous to do it. We do it regularly through the day. We certainly do it last thing at night. It's lovely. And by the way, we have a little ritual. Isn't it funny how um, even non-Anglicans have little rituals in their life? And we have a little ritual in our life. When I'm going off on a journey, I sit in the front seat of the car. My wife always comes out and she just touches the front of the car. And I know what she's doing, the blood of Jesus on this car. And my little, two little ones have picked it up as well. You know, and they come out and parade and the blood of Jesus, they have to touch the front of the car. That's all was done. And that, that's why, of course, you know, it's a marvelous thing to actually put your hand on your child's head and say, just the blood of Jesus on you. It's lovely to bring them up with that anointing that comes through, through this. Notice what happened. The angel of death truly passed over them. Isn't it strange? Did God need that sign? Well, I don't know, but obviously he did in this time. And so he told them to do it. There was a sign. And because they were in the house, they were protected. And this is all Old Testament stuff. Lovely. Let me take you to another one. Now, this is a nice one, right? In the, in the book of Joshua, all right? Joshua chapter 2. And here we have a lady, Rahab the harlot. I've really felt for Rahab sometimes, you know, that she's always got her sin mentioned with her name, Rahab the harlot. Right? It's rather like saying, oh yes, David the liar, or, you know, Fred the, the thief, or whatever. And this woman's all was known as uh, Rahab the harlot. Now, she was one of the very few believers in Jericho. And she'd heard of what God had done for the Israelites. Do you remember this story? You should do. And here we have uh, Joshua sending a reconnaissance party out to find out the lie of the land. There it is, the land lies behind. They want to know what uh, actually it's like, what the cities are like, what the people are like, and so on. So these two spies have been sent into the land. And uh, I think we have read from verse 8. Rahab here is talking, and she starts saying what she's heard about the Israelites. Do you know the Canaanites were scared to death? of the Israelites coming into the land. They'd heard of what the, the mighty God of the Israelites had done for them. And here, verse 8, I think we'll begin, Joshua 2. And before they laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. Now this woman made ropes. That was her job. Isn't that a Romans 8.28, by the way? Right, isn't it? That all things work to the good. Don't you think that's lovely? Right, they want to escape from the city, and the one house they take refuge in, she happens to make ropes. Couldn't be better, could it? And there it is. Okay, she comes to them upon the roof, and she's got something to say to them. And this is a very wise woman. She says, now hold on, you're God's people, and I'm not letting you go till you bless me. Right? Now hang about. This is it. And she says, verse 9, she said to them, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, 
and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. That's what spies wanted to hear, by the way. You know, all the inhabitants faint because of you. Good news. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what he did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were, were on the other side of Jordan, Zion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Most of the people had heard of these things and they were busy building up the defences. Rahab had heard and she said, if that's the type of God they've got, that's the type of God I want. And she believed in this God of Israel. Now here she is. She's a firm believer. They've come to exactly the right house. Well, the Holy Spirit led them. And then she says this, verse 12, got to get a blessing. Now therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives out of death. Don't just bless me. I want my whole family blessed. Thanks. For the men, and the men answered her, Our life for yours, if you utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may you go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, now here's the mark. When we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's house home unto me, and it shall be that whoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless, and whosoever shall be with thee in thine house, his blood shall be upon our head, if any hand be upon him. And so it goes on. Now, isn't this remarkable? They told her, make sure the mark is on your house. A red rope hanging out of the window and bring all of your family into the middle. Now, undoubtedly, Rahab thought this, oh, well, they'll come along, they'll batter in the front door, and then they'll run a, mo a, a, a mock through the city, right, taking all the city and, and killing people and all the rest. But the minute they see the red cord hanging out of my window, they say, ah, there's the red cord that we've been warned about and we mustn't kill her. That's undoubtedly how she thought about it. But God had other plans and lovely other plans. And Joshua came one day to size up the problem, you know, have a good look at Jericho and see uh, how he was going to do it. And do you remember what he, he did? He met the Lord Jesus standing there. And he said, oh, who are you? Are you on our side or uh, are you on uh, their side? And the Lord said uh, to him, I'm the commander of the army. And Joshua thought he was the commander of the army, and this was a bit of a shock. And Jesus told him what the battle plan was going to be. And what was the battle plan? Why they were going to walk around the city, and then the walls would fall down. Wonderful. Just like that. And the walls came tumbling down, is the song that's known today. And notice verse 15 carefully in this. Where did Rahab live then? Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. Isn't that remarkable? Here was Rahab, and her house was actually in the thing that God was going to knock over. Lovely. But there was a red rope hanging out of the window. And what happened? The people marched all the way round, and they shouted. And I can imagine the scene with all the angels rushing up with their battering rams, right? And down came the wall. But there were certain angels who had the opposite job. And they went to the bit of wall in which Rahab lived, and they had the job of keeping the wall up. And this is remarkable. The whole wall fell down, except for the little pinnacle in which Rahab lived. Wonder, as a testimony to everyone. And what had done it? Why, there was a little cord hanging out of her, her window, blood red hanging there. I think Rahab must have been slightly nervous when she heard the rumbling. In fact, very nervous, right? 
and when she heard the loud crashes and so on. And suddenly there was a shaking and Mr. Jones, who lives next door, suddenly his house had collapsed. She must have been very, very worried indeed. But what happened? The Lord was good to his word. The mark on the house was enough to show the angels which one to hold up. And she was secure in her house. Many, many times I felt as if the house was shaking and about to collapse. But the lovely thing is, if you know that God's mark is upon it, you have complete peace. Right? If I'd known, and I'd been there, that the wall was going to collapse, I would have told her, now look, move house, first thing. Right? Go and sell your house. Move to a house in the center of the city, well away from the wall. And that would have been natural thinking. In fact, the mark was enough to sustain her. But that woman knew that the mark was enough to sustain her. This is all Old Testament. Do you see, there's a mark that God puts on certain houses, on certain people, and they're always safe and can dwell in complete security knowing that God is in charge. One other example in the Old Testament, just in case you're not getting this message loud and clear. Let's go through to the book of Zechariah. Now this is a remarkable one. Zechariah chapter 2. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 2 you remember don't you Haggai and Zechariah back in the land and they've been in exile in Babylon 70 years back they come to the land and what do they see they find an absolutely destroyed city the wall is down the houses are destroyed the temples destroyed now, what's the first thing you would do in that circumstance? Now, if you lived in Jerusalem, knowing the hordes and the armies that passed by Jerusalem regularly, the first thing you do is build the wall. And undoubtedly, the first thing in their natural thinking was, let's get this wall up, and once the wall's up, then we can get on building the Lord's house and building the other houses. But God says to them, ah, 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 ah. That's not the way it's going to be. And he says to them, no, you get on building the temple. Forget about the wall, build the temple. And his promise is this. Now here you've got an invisible mark upon them. Look at the promise. Um, verse 4. And the angel said unto him, run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls. Don't build the wall. For the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about her, and will be the glory in the midst of her. So the Lord says, doesn't matter, you get on building the temple, and I will be the defensive wall all the way round, and I'll deal with all the enemies. Do you know, it's, it's a major problem in history as to why Jerusalem was untouched for this period of time. It was one of the most peaceful times in terms of armies dashing past Jerusalem that the Jews had ever known. Well, why was it? God was there. He was my, they didn't see this wall of fire, but God said he was a wall of fire and they believed it. Oh, the promise is even better than that. Right over in uh, verse 8. Look at this. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he sent unto... Sorry, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you touches the apple of his eye. And that's where we get the phrase, the apple of his eye. In Hebrew, it's actually the word for a pupil. He that touches you, touches the very pupil of my eye. What does it mean? It means this. The pupil of your eye is the most protected part of your body. Now that may come as a big shock to some of you, but medically, that is absolutely accurate. There is no part of your body that has more defense mechanisms than the pupil of your eye. Did you know that? It is remarkable, and that's why this is in here. Well, just think of it for a moment, right? First of all, you have eyebrows, right? I hope I'm not being too eyebrow for anyone tonight. But here's the eyebrow across the top. What's that do? Well, you see, the sweat on your skin is very slightly acid. And it does your skin a power of good. It stops all the funguses growing on your skin. It's very good for you, indeed. But the one part of your body it's no good for is the eye. So to protect the eye, you've got an eyebrow. And when the beads of sweat come dribbling down the forehead, they're diverted by the eyebrow and down they go down the side of the face. Now that's the first defense mechanism. The next defense mechanism is you've got uh, the bone around the eye. Now, someone can say, he punched me in the eye. Oh, no, he didn't. He punched you around the eye, but he didn't actually punch the eye. 
because you'll notice you can't actually touch the eye when you go like that. Don't try too hard, right? We'll have to pray for you afterwards. But the bone around the eye actually protects the eye. You're right, it all comes up in a big bruise, but normally the eye is absolutely fine uh, with that. So that's the second defense mechanism. The next thing is, of course, you have the ability to squint like this. Sit your eyes. If the sun's too bright and going to do damage to your eye, you just uh, screw them up like this. And that protects your eye. Now there's the third mechanism. The fourth mechanism are these eyelashes, right? And they protect you from dust and, and other things and stop it going in the eye. I mean, this is pretty remarkable, isn't it? The other thing is you have uh, two sorts of tears in your eye, right? That constantly wash the eye all the time. And any dust particles, along it comes, and you have other defense mechanisms as well. The message in this passage is, now, Zachariah, you forget the natural defense. You get on building my house, and I will be your shield. I'll be the wall of fire around you. You're like the pupil of my eye. I promise you that I'll protect you. Now, all this is Old Testament stuff. Do you really think that it's different for we who are believers today? Of course it's not. If anything, it must be more glorious than that. Don't you agree? Must be so. Here it is. God marked them and he protected them. They could have peace knowing that God's hand was upon them. You don't have to live like a nervous wreck anymore. You really don't. You don't have to spend your life wondering whether the devil's going to get you and, oh Lord, I'm not sure whether you're big enough to really handle this situation. I think you need me in this situation. You don't have to be in that type of state. You can trust God because he has put his mark upon you. Why, even in the book of Revelation, the servants of the living God are sealed. Do you remember that? I think we'll go through to the book of Revelation. Go through to uh, Revelation 6. Now, I don't care which what your views on Revelation are. I really don't care. It's not interesting to me tonight. If you take this as the church, okay. If you take it as the literal Jews, okay. It's the point about the seal that I want to get at tonight. Right? And in chapter 6, you've got the terrible judgments of the tribulation talked about. The judgments coming. It's bad. And in the last verse, a question is asked. And the question is this. For the great day of his wrath is come, who shall be able to stand? Now that's the question. And that question in the Bible is answered in the next chapter. Who can stand? I'll tell you who can stand. Those who are sealed with the seal of the living God. They're the ones who'll be able to stand. And in fact, in the next verse, you see the angels of judgment, right? That are going to be thrown against the world. And what do you see? They're held back just for a moment. Verse 1. After these things, chapter 7 this is, after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor on any tree. Now hold on you winds, before you come down and start doing the work that God has got for you to do, you just hold back a minute. God's got something to do. Verse 2, and I saw an angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And you see, with the seal of the living God upon them, no matter what was being um, sent upon the earth. These people were going to be fine. That's the seal of God on these servants. What was this seal of God? Well, it's not absolutely clear. I believe it's the presence of the Holy Spirit in them. I think uh, two more little verses will show a little more. If you go to Revelation 14, verse 1. Revelation 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And one of the things the seals did, it had the na they had the name of God written upon them. God's name was right here. And the angelic realm could see it. They knew that these were ones who belonged unto God, and that they were under God's protection. There's another little verse in Revelation Chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation 12 and verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. 
They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. These were the sealed ones, and because they are sealed, they are safe. Of course, if it's true then, in the Old Testament, if it's true in this future time, of course it's true now, but the tragedy is the majority of Christians don't know it's true. The majority is still afraid of what the devil can do. And the devil can do this, and the devil can do that, and the devil's done this, and the devil's done that. Listen, it's time we started saying, yes, okay, the devil's done all of that. But praise God, Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And on the cross, he held up the powers and principalities to public shame. Hallelujah. Defeating them there on the cross. And it's in his resurrection life we now live and move and have our being. We are the sealed ones. All right, where does it say we're sealed? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Sorry, chapter 1 I think it is. I'll find it when I get there. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that's right. I'm going to read verse 20 because this is a lovely verse. And onwards. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which established, established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us. Isn't that good news? Sealed. What did a seal mean? I mean, they didn't have the good postal service that we have. If you wrote a letter in those days, you had to put your seal on it. What does a, did a seal mean in these days? A seal meant two main things. One, it meant ownership. If your seal was on something, it belonged to you. Right? Those of you who have lots of books, it's worth putting your seal somewhere in the middle of them. Have you noticed that? Right? Well worth signing your name or something to identify it as yours. That's the first thing that a seal was used for. The second thing was security. If a letter arrived and you wanted to know that you were the first to read it, you used to look at the seal. If the seal was broken, someone else had read it. If it wasn't, then it's secure. Right? No one had read this. This was a confidential letter. Those two things were represented in the seal. Ownership, security. And the seal of God upon you means exactly those two things. First of all, you belong to God. You're not bought, you know, with corruptible things like silver and gold. Certainly not. You have been bought with the precious blood of the Lamb, of Jesus Christ himself. And that is what has purchased you. You belong to him. And I'll tell you this, God has marked you out as his. The devil knows it. The angelic realm know it. They know you belong to God. He's put his seal upon you. The second thing is you are secure. 1 Peter again says, who are kept by the power of God. And the seal of God means we can trust in his keeping power. We've been sealed. I love the next bit as well. Not only have we been sealed, but look, the Holy Spirit is the earnest as well. What's an earnest? Well, you know when you take your suit into the cleaners and they give you a little ticket. That's an earnest, right? And what it means is, call back for it later on and you can have it. And the Holy Spirit in us means Jesus is coming again for us. He's going to pick us up one day. Praise the Lord, right? When we're without spot and without blemish, he's coming for us. And that glorious day is coming quite soon. It's the seal of the living God that is upon us. I think we'll see the other verse as well that says the same in Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> in Ephesians. Verse 13. in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Now that's the truth about us. We've been sealed. And if we know that the blood of Jesus has purchased us, he's put his mark upon us and the devil has to see that mark, we can begin having the peace of God in our lives. I feel we should pray in just a moment. I've got a little more to say. But I feel we should pray for those who even this weekend 
have come away and are nervous of what is ahead of them. You know they've left trouble at home. You may be concerned about the loved ones that you've left behind and so on. I believe tonight we can pray and we can really ask God to give us a revelation of this fact that we truly are his. And we can see him taking care of them in our faith. See that, do you know, we're released from it. Then all the burden rolls away and we receive a revelation of his keeping power. However, before I allow you to pray and uh, to finally go home, I want to say one other thing. And this is a revelation that the Lord gave to me. When God seals you, every other seal is broken at the same time. There's only one seal on your life, and if God seals on your life, the devil's seal has been broken. Praise God. And that's official. Praise the Lord. I know in my own life, you know, with the troubled background that I had, that I felt that the devil really had me. Through all the things that I'd been through as a child and so on. I mean, I was a wounded individual. I had no love at all flowing uh, from me. That, I felt, was the seal of Satan on my life. Well, that's it. Satan's got me. I've always been like this. Oh, what can you do with me, God? This is what has been done in my life. The damage that's been caused by the circumstances and so on that I've been through. But the lovely thing is, when I was converted, I realized it had to be a change. And the seal of God on my life meant that I could claim freedom from those things that had affected me in the past. And I, the good news is, I've claimed the promises of God. And I can tell you this, the devil's seals are broken. You can do the same. You don't have to be, you know, overburdened by the things that have affected you. And troubled still by the things that were put upon you by the devil. The seal of God means that the devil's seals have been broken. And I want to take you to the last passage I'm going to look at tonight. In Matthew, at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27... Matthew 27, and I want to have a look at something that had puzzled me for ages. And I suddenly got a revelation of it. Do you know, we have wonderful midweek meetings at home. They're lovely, they're like uh, seed meetings. You know, loads and loads of seeds are scattered. And I love receiving seed because I know that if I plant them right, they soon germinate and they soon come up and soon they're bearing fruit. And in the middle of a meeting, I was sitting there, and the meeting was about something else altogether, suddenly this little thing popped into my mind, this little word here, and suddenly I understood it. I hadn't understood it before. Let me read the little passage. You remember uh, Jesus has just died, and they put his body into the tomb, and uh, the chief priests are worried, because Jesus had publicly announced that he would rise from the dead after three days. Publicly made announcement about it. And they're very worried. In case he might. And so they decide, well look, if, he, uh, if his body isn't there, it must be because the disciples have come and stolen his body away. We must make sure that they don't get the chance. And so they go uh, to arrange protection for the tomb. Verse 62. Now the great, this is Matthew 27, 62. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I'll rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He's risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch. Right, you've got a guard of your own. Go your way, make it as sure as you can, so they went and made the sepulchre sh sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now there's a seal on this tomb. And there's an encampment of soldiers armed to the teeth, right, all around the tomb. Isn't this wonderful, by the way? Praise God. No one was going to believe that the disciples stole the body of Jesus after this. Not after this encampment of soldiers was there. But it's the next two verses that gave me the problem. Chapter 28, 1 and 2. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. 
as a little bit. The stone was rolled back by the angel and the angel sat on it. Now that's the bit that gave me the problem. And I've wondered about this for a long, long time. Do you know how the tombs were organized in these days? You had a cave that was cut into the solid rock face. You then had a groove that was cut below and often above as well. And there was a, a stone that was in place. And it was a pretty heavy stone. And just by the tomb entrance, there was a little nick cut at the bottom. So that the stone could roll into place quite easily, but it was jolly tough to get it out again. Right? That little nick was very important. Now, to close the tomb was simple. To open it was another matter altogether. You see? Now, what happened? Well, Jesus rose. Now, first of all, when Jesus rose, he didn't come out through the entrance. He didn't have to do that. Jesus rose right through the rock face. You have no problem over that at all. But it was necessary for the tomb to be open so that we would know it was empty, so that the soldiers would know it was empty, and so that everyone else would know that it was empty. And so the angel came and rolled back the stone, it says, and sat on it. Now my, problem, my problems were these. One, why didn't the guard, once they've recovered, just roll the stone back, right, and pretend that nothing had happened, and call the disciples a liar? I mean, it's, it's quite a problem. Have you ever wondered that or has it never crossed your mind wouldn't it have been simple for them to get up and say oh well hold on there are only those people around quick roll it back and and i mean no one will be looking for the seal so just roll it back and say oh they're lying it's not true they never came at all no 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 we've been here all night now that was the first problem that i had and this was a big one and the second one was how on earth did the angel sit on it i mean i imagined it in these two grooves how was the angel able to sit on this stone I couldn't visualize it. Suddenly, sitting in our midweek meeting, I saw it. The angel hadn't just rolled back the stone. The angel had actually taken the stone out of the groove and had put it flat in front of the entrance. Isn't that wonderful? And proceeded to sit on it. Lovely. Polishing his nails or doing whatever angels do when they've got a bit of time on their hands. Now imagine the poor old te uh, temple guard. They suddenly come round and they see the stone out. Now to get that stone back, it's going to need scaffolding. They can't just move it in. That tomb's open and no one's going to close it. And there's the angel sitting there, right on the top. Really lovely. And God spoke to me and he just said this. Once his seal is on something, the other seals are totally broken. And that which God opens, no man closes. And that which God closes, no man opens. That's the work of God. And do you know the truth for every Christian and the truth that unfortunately hasn't dawned in the life of most Christians is this. God has opened your tomb of bondage. He's opened it. God has opened the tomb of defeat. And they're empty. Praise God. God has opened those things that have beset you for so long and he's given you now the liberty to walk free. The seal is broken and his seal is now upon you. And if only we would see it, we would see God's angel sitting on the stone that used to keep us down. Hallelujah. There is release in the work of Jesus. And his seal is on every one of you in this room who is born again. It's time for us to ask God to give us a revelation of these things. That God is the one who has marked us out. Oh, I can't see it. No, I don't know what, what the seal is. But I do know the angels can see it. And I do know the devil can see it. And that's why he's so afraid of us. Right? Of course he is. He can see exactly what God has done in us. Now, it's that revelation that I want to pray for tonight. That we might receive it. I can't think of a better way to begin a conference than to actually get people walking around knowing they're sealed in this type of way. We'll really get off to victory if we get a revelation of this thing. And so we're going to ask God to give us a revelation. In Ephesians 1 again, it was Paul who prayed that God would indeed give them revelations. We've got to pray the same tonight. And after we've prayed it, I'm going to ask people here, any people who are concerned about the situation at home, you may have problems in your church, Problems with your elders, problems with your flock. 
right? You may have problems at work. You may have problems even getting a job. You may have problems in your family. I believe tonight we can really stand on the fact that we are sealed and we can see God move into those areas in a wonderful way. Praise God. Now, I believe it. Now, I believe this weekend we're going to see the release of the freedom of God in our circumstances. I was in the meeting just a, a few weeks ago and the Lord gave me a, a word of knowledge concerning a person who had a relative. I think it was a brother or a cousin. I can't remember the exact details of it. Um, that they had chronic kidney failure and that the Lord just wanted to touch them and to heal them where they were. And this woman came out and I prayed and it was her brother or cousin, I've forgotten which it is, but we prayed. And apparently he's a minister over in Northern Ireland and she rang him up immediately after the meeting and said, do you know, he had a word of knowledge about you and I just know God's going to do something. And apparently this man uh, had kidney failure, he had just... Uh, one kidney partially working, just partially working. And they'd said that they wanted to do a transplant, but they couldn't because there were problems in his particular case. And he went for a checkup two weeks later to the doctor, and he was discharged from the hospital in that same appointment. And she told me that just last week. I believe that God can do anything for us, you see? But we've got to receive the revelation of just who we are and just what God has done for us. Now, can I pray for us? Praise God. Then we'll ask people to stand and we'll pray for them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.